Buenas tardes, estamos haciendo una transmisión en este momento de la Fundación Proa con motivo de la muestra de la exposición La Suite, inaugurada alrededor de mediados de julio. Hoy tenemos al artista de esa obra con un video llamado The Black Bay Sequence del año 2010, o sea, la secuencia de la Bahía Negra, hecha por una gran artista finlandesa, la artista fotógrafa, videoartista Elina Broterus. Ella ha trabajado con fotografías e imágenes en movimiento, utilizando historias íntimas. Sus autorretratos investigan la relación entre el individuo y el espacio. Se ha dedicado también, o en su obra también transfiere mucho la idea de género, cuestionando tanto el lugar de la humanidad dentro de la naturaleza, en donde ella interviene esos paisajes naturales que son tan propios del artista nórdico, que pareciera que permanentemente está conquistando y adueñándose de esos grandes espacios vacíos. El artista nació en Finlandia, como yo les dije al principio, y se graduó en fotografía en la Universidad de Arte y Diseño de Helsinki, ahora denominada la Escuela de Arte, de Diseño y Arquitectura de la Universidad Álvar Alto en el año 2000. So, Elina, thank you very much for being with us. We are really very happy that we have the occasion to receive you in PROA, in this institution, in Buenos Aires, Argentina, South America, We talked about this institution a few days ago. And as you know, the, your work in this exhibition is the Black Bay sequence. According to what we know from curators and from the organizers of PROA, this is a study of the weather, water, and sky, and of a lonely figure who enters the water, returns, and walks out of the frame. I would like you after giving you this welcome, to know a little bit more about this interesting video. The Black Bay sequence was filmed during an entire summer. The camera is always fixed. I, I marked the place of the tripod on the beach so I could always position it exactly in the same spot. So what happens is that throughout the summer, you have this person who goes into water and returns, then there's a cut. And the next sequence comes exactly the same thing, same protagonist, except that the weather has changed. So sometimes it's raining, sometimes it's sunny. It's a lot during the nighttime because, you know, during the Finnish summer, like uh, I guess during the Argentinian winter, you have very long days. So, so the sun is staying up until maybe 11 o'clock in the evening and still even two o'clock in the morning, you have this beautiful like opalesque skies where the light is coming like from everywhere. So I wanted to make this investigation of what happens when one repeats the same thing over and over again. It's like the theme and the variations which is a current or common musical way of, of constructing a composition. It's like a Warholian movie in a way that there is not much happening, but it lasts very long. It's one hour. Uh, the whole summer has been compressed into one hour. There's no sound. It's a silent piece. And it's really inviting the spectator into a silent confrontation. And surprisingly, I have heard of many spectators that, you know, even if my idea was never that one should watch the whole film, my idea was more like, you pass, you see what the weather is like, you go your way, you look at something else, maybe you pass again and you see, oh, now the rain has stopped. But surprisingly, many people say that they forget themselves while they are watching the piece. And all of a sudden they realize that they have seen the whole hour 
of, of it. Thank you very much, uh, Ellen, for your answer. I would like to ask you something going back into your biography and your history. And I would like to ask you, why did you become an artist? How was your childhood, if it was your childhood related to art, to the art experience, your first relation with art, and also the discovery of those materials used by your mother when she was studying art? I would like to say I became an artist because I was too impatient to become a good scientist. You see, I was first studying chemistry and other science, natural sciences at the university, but I realized after four years of studies that I want to do something which is, you know, where the results are more immediate. So that's when I applied to the art school to study photography in the art school. It does come in a way from my parents, like, you know, everything comes from the childhood. Both my parents were scientists, but my father was a hobby photographer. So I have these childhood memories of him developing black and white photos in the bathroom. And then when my father died, when he was very young, he was 36 years old, and my mother became a widow at 36. She went to art school. I think that was her dream probably since long time, but she could not do it earlier. But I remember her being like, really having like her, you know, time of fulfillment for those five years that she lived after my father's death. She took me and my brother to see art exhibitions. And I was kind of following from the side, like the lessons that she was taking at the art school. And I like to say that I'm a photographer because of my father, because of his example. And he gave me my first camera when I was eight years old. But because of my mother, I'm an artist. She died in 1985 um, when I was only 13 years old. And then like decades later, I discovered, or actually my brother did discover a stock of old watercolor paper that used to belong to my mom, but she never had the time to, to use it. And my brother gave it to me saying, you're an artist, so maybe you can do something with this. And I had, I had that paper for a couple of years. And then I, I had this wonderful commission in, on the island of Corsica in 2019. And there I finally found a proper use to my mother's watercolor paper. In Corsica, I was following on the footsteps of, of W.G. Zebald, who is one of my favorite writers. And he, as you might know, was interested in Corsica. He was writing a, a book about Corsica, but then he also died prematurely. He was born the same year as my mother. And uh, in these fragmentary texts that were published after his death, he talks about a certain cemetery in Corsica. And he was writing about those little plants that are growing there between the tombstones, like weeds, like, you know, nobody planted them. They just appeared there. And he found them really beautiful, much more beautiful than the German, like uh, geometrical, a bit austere cemetery plantations that he was used to. And then what I did in Corsica, I found, I went to this cemetery and I collected those little plants that were growing there, the natural little modest weeds. And I made a herbarium with these. I treated the watercolor papers of my mother with a cyanotype solution. And then there on location, I, I placed the plants on the paper. I exposed them in the sun and I washed them with water. And that's how these pictures came about. So it's an homage, not only to Zebald, but also to my mother, to whom I owe so much. That's very nice. Corsica is, is something completely different. Why did you choose this book? And if, and if this happened before or after to follow a writer, to follow the steps of a writer 
many things happen a little bit by coincidence. I was actually first invited to Corsica to be a speaker in a symposium. And a few years earlier, I had bought uh, on a book fair this, uh, these fragmentary Corsica texts by Zebal that had just been translated into my native language, the Finnish language. And you know, as, as it happens, we buy books and then we just forget them in the bookshelves. So I never read this book before I got the invitation. And I read it on the plane on my way to Corsica. And then when the organizer of the symposium, the director of the Mediterranean Center for Photography, first of all, he must have liked my presentation. And then secondly, when he saw the book I was reading, after that, the next day, he made a proposal, a proposition to me to come the next year to Corsica for uh, something that the French call uh, une commande. So basically it was a carte blanche. Uh, I was invited, I could do whatever I wanted. Uh, and then after that, we curated an exhibition together with the work I did. So, so of course, the idea was that you know, Zebal could be an integral part of this uh, project. And so what I did was that I looked up places that he mentions in the book, and then I found my way to these places to, to make my work there. I don't recall that I would have earlier used a writer as a trigger to make new work. I do like an interaction between different art forms I have a lot of pieces that have something to do with music. Um, also, I'm very interested in architecture, uh, but I think that an art history, of course, I mean, I, I owe a lot to my predecessors, but I think this was the first time I, I had literature as a starting point for, for my photographic work. That's right. And I think that we are, we are talking about Campo Santo, no? Of Seval. That's the, that's the work that you worked so much in during your stay in Corsica. And re regarding this last work, you always work between autobiographical and art historical approaches. Your images of the 19th and the 20th century, the paintings, your reference to the maybe the iconic painter of the Romanticism, of the German Romanticism, Caspar Friedrich. I would like to listen a little bit about all this, all, all these relations between you, your autobiography, the relations between the historical approach of the 19th and 20th century, and this strong relation of Romanticism, of your, the Friedrich image of the Wanderer, this painting that, in my humble opinion, maybe it's the, the symbol and the concept of what Romanticism is during the 19th century of Europe. My first artistic work is autobiographical. I think the reason is my earlier studies of science. So actually I did two years um, kind of parallel. I was, during the terms, I was already at the art university, but during the holidays, I was finishing my master's degree in chemistry. So I used, you know, two summers and two Christmas holidays to write my final thesis and do the final exams. So this kept me in a sort of mindset of, of analytical thinking and maybe you know more rigorous kind of, of you know take to the world. So the moment I graduated from the university from my scientific studies, that was the beginning of my like uh, serious artistic production because all of a sudden it was like a leap you know away from the analytical into the intuitive. And that's also when all those issues that, you know, things that had happened, like the, the early death of my parents, my too early bad marriage that, you know, resulted in a divorce one year later, all those things suddenly like rose up and needed to be treated. And that's something that 
always has happened to me because in a way I, I see it as a cyclical movement in my in my production, the autobiography that every once in a while comes back. And in between, I do other things. I do, you know, art historical stuff. I do this and that. But the autobiography is something I never um, strive for it or, you know, run after it, but I let it come when it needs to come. I let those images happen. Um, yeah, so the, the early series was when I was still a student in the art school. And then I moved to France. That's why I'm also in the collection of the French uh, FRAC uh, institutions, because I'm, like some newspaper wrote, that I'm the most French of the Finnish photographers, <laughs> because it's 22 years now since I moved to France. And I, I share my time between my native Finland and my adoptive France. Um, yeah, so when I moved here first as a young artist, important thing then was to learn the language. I was uh, an artist in residence at Musée Nicephore-Nieps in chalon sur saône and I didn't really speak French. I never learned it at school. So, so it was a priority to, to gain like some access to the, this new country. So I was using post-it stickers. Uh, I, I wrote the names of the objects in my room and then later on also uh, in the landscape or you know putting them on me or on other people to learn words to, to learn vocabulary so this was in a way a series that was between autobiographical and a more general um, work because the presence of language or the conceptual thinking behind these images uh, has at least an equal importance to the autobiographical. Then when I was living in France and also starting to exhibit internationally, which gave me access to a lot of art museums, I, I felt that I want to, you know, bridge the gaps that I had in my education because in Finland, we have wonderful museums, but we don't have the Louvre or the Musée d'Orsay or, you know, the, the Met and the MoMA. So when I started to travel and live in Paris, I kind of self-educated myself in art history. And this is where comes the next big series, which is called The New Painting. So I was digging into the iconography of, of um, classical painting and borrowing themes and treating them in my own medium, which was then analog large format color photography. I borrowed titles also. So for instance, from Kaspar David, I took uh, Der Wanderer um, above the sea of fog, but I only took the first part of the title. And I did my versions of the lonesome person um, facing the, the empty landscape. It was important for me to take up this iconic piece and do it as a woman. So, because I remember from my studies that this picture was used as an example of, you know, the, the dominating male gaze, which is sort of like, in, like, a power position, like on the mountaintop, the, the man is, you know, reigning over the whole world. And I wanted to put into that mountaintop, I wanted to put a young woman there in a way to, to you know, take back something that I felt that um, the society has taken from women. So this is my kind of like early, early little feminist clan d'oeil also. But then also the like one reason why it is always me in the picture, it's because when I travel, that's when I mainly do new work and I most often travel alone. So if I want a human presence in the picture, I'm the one who is available. It's you have like different versions of the wanderer, no? It's and recently you had one. I think that in, in a project that has been done in Norway, 
it has become like a very often recurring theme in my work, this person seen from the back in front of a landscape. It's almost like a signature piece to me, I would say now after, after so many years of, of um, treating the same motif. I think what, what I like about the back so much is that it's calm, it's inviting, and it's kind of avoiding confrontation. It's like an invitation for the spectator to join in and to share the space together with artists who has selected what, what we are viewing. So the artist is there in front of the landscape deciding what to see or what, what to look at and then inviting the spectator to join in this shared contemplation. This is the 21st century view of the, of the painting, no? and how you as an artist, uh, as a woman, are introduced in, in all what you said before. But it's not only images of the 19th century, Elena, that you are inspired, because for you, it's very important, the Fluxus movement. Fluxus came in as a very, handy solution to a problem that I had uh, after pretty much 20 years of self-portraiture. I had come into this dead end where I thought that I had done all the positions I could imagine that I could do with my body in front of the camera. Like I had been sitting and standing and lying down and back and frontal and both profiles. And I thought, you know, I have done it all. Like what more can I do? And uh, then I actually, I had, I had seen an exhibition on the Japanese avant-garde in the MoMA, I think 2012. And um, I remember from there, these tiny cards on the wall with like poetic and uh, bizarre like instructions. That's how I took them. Like things like, you know, stand on a sandy beach, watch yourself in a mirror, step back into the water. And this was written by some Mieko Shiomi. I had never heard of her. I didn't even know that it was a, a, a woman at the time. But I was intrigued by those little texts and I wrote them down in my notebook. And then a couple of years later, I went to, to visit uh, Berlin to see the exhibition at the Berlinische Galerie of René Bloch's collection and archive. And there I discovered these same little cards and massive amounts more of same style writing. And I learned that these are so-called event scores from Fluxus artists. And I asked René, like, what do you think? Could I use these in my work? Like as a, as a starting point, like following the instructions to, to make a piece of my own. And he said, of course, that's exactly what they are meant for. Because the Fluxus artists, um, they often wrote a description of a piece or, or like an idea that could be realized or it could be just left as a, as a written piece. And, and then they just were, you know, they were there out in the world and free for anybody to, to utilize. So I got nominated for this prize in Switzerland. And, uh, and that's when I, when I really started uh, to use the event scores, I went, I did a lot of archival research. I bought a lot of books and I, I, I went to online archives. And then later on, I, I also, I got another prize in Paris the next year. And that's when I got um, access, for instance, to the archive of the Pompidou Center. So I, uh, I collected as much as I could of these event scores. And then I just, you know, played around and had fun with them because it's actually it's like the very opposite of the of the kind of work that I had been doing so far where I'm you know rather stiff and central and always very serious 
uh, not to say sad. Uh, these were the polar opposite. These were fun. They were loose. They were like really playful. I would not have had the idea to stand on my head had I not read a score or an idea by John Balasari where he said like do reversals, like stand upside down, right backwards. So, so that's the story. That was really um, a big discovery for me and a completely new chapter in my work to step from the, let's say, Renaissance painting and, and romanticism, kind of getting fed up with the sublime and, and doing these funny, weird, absurd pictures where I'm staring at an orange or, you know, putting my dog inside a harpsichord. You as a Finnish artist, architecture and design could not be absent. And I think that both of them are very present in your work too. Well, architecture actually was a quite recent discovery for me. And it happened, funnily enough, with a Finnish architect, but through France, because there is uh, a beautiful uh, individual house by the Finnish architect Alvar Aalto, just outside Paris. It's called Maison Louis Carré. And this house is now a museum since the death of, of Louis Carré's widow some 15 years back. The director decided that she also wants to start to organize contemporary art exhibitions in the building, in the house. So she invited me to do a show back in 2014, I think. And I said, of course, I would be pleased to, but I would also like to make one picture in the house that we could then put in the exhibition as a, as a mise en abîme, like the same place you see in your, like in the real life, and then you see in the photograph. So she said no problem and invited me to stay in the house for three days on my own. And that was also, it was also like a life, life changing experience for me because I thought as a Finn to know my Alvar Aalto by heart. And honestly, I had this idea that he's a little bit boring, you know, always the red brick and the wood and the copper and, you know, like. But I was genuinely surprised uh, when I was actually living in his house, how well designed it was and how pleasant an experience it was, how it affects our well-being to be able to stay in a well-designed space. So in a way I was this, you know, waking up very late for, for architecture, but now I'm this ambassador for, for architecture because I think that most of us, we spend most of our time in rather mediocre spaces. And it makes such a great difference when you are in a place that is actually really well thought after. So this idea of one image made in Maison Louis Carré actually resulted in a whole series because I was like, I, I got carried away. I was just like so inspired by, by working in there and, you know, following the sun from different room to different room throughout the day. And, and this led into an idea of finding other houses by other architects, also important, but always private houses, family homes, because what I think is lacking in architectural photography is the inhabitant. So what I do in, in my iconic houses, pictures, I always introduce the presence of somebody who lives there or could have lived there, or maybe was a visitor, maybe a friend of the family, you know, maybe some distant cousin who came, came by imaginary characters, imaginary women who then live their lives in the houses. They take baths, they sleep, they read, they cook, they eat, you know, what people do at home. So this human presence 
in the photos is again like an in, like an intro like an invitation for the spectator you can identify yourself with the character thinking oh that woman could be me then i have also been working in his own home that he constructed in helsinki in the munkiniemi region uh, together with his architect wife Aino. So so these three Aldo houses I have done so far. And then a very funny um, like a ski ski cabin called Futuro, Futuro, which is from the 1970s. It's like this UFO, like a plastic flying saucer, eight uh, meters in uh, in diameter. And uh, I was able to work there also. There's the, the prototype which is uh, behind the, um, the Ouija Center of Arts in uh, just outside Helsinki in Espo. So, it's like so, an UFO, no? It's, it's, it's like a yellow UFO, I think. And yeah, so this series is something that I plan to continue, you know, as, as long as possible. Every time when I get the, the possibility to work in some fantastic house. Elena. You are part of your work. It's not the artist. You are involved also in your work. You are a character of your own work. How is the relation between you as an artist and the spectator? Well, you see, I'm both the artist and the spectator and the model. So it's like this merry-go-round of, of uh, roles and gazes that I have. I think most of my work is somehow about, you know, watching or observing or contemplating. That's probably what I like to do most in life, you know, walk around with my camera, discover places and, you know, just go through the eye, let the eye decide that this is something I want to work on. So then I stop, I put up the tripod, you know, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But really like the the sitting and contemplating the world is what I really enjoy. Taking this idea of the spectator the furthest, maybe in a recent piece called Le Spectateur Mise en Abîme, which I did last April when I was invited to work in, in Normandy. Uh, I have this picture where I'm standing wearing yellow, I'm standing by a tree and looking at the landscape. And then I produced a huge wallpaper of this photo and I glued it in my studio and I re-photographed myself wearing the same clothes, contemplating the picture where I stand contemplating the landscape. So it's this, what the French call mise en abîme, where it's like a picture in a picture. And this is something I, I plan to continue. I was quite fascinated by this experiment. And I think that in some future exhibitions, you will see more work like this. Well, Elena, a really beginning with the Black Bay sequence and ending with this last work that you mentioned in Normandy, I also want to, to mention Seabound, this beautiful work that you have done in Norway for so many of the concepts you have told us are really in, in this book and in this work that you've been doing for the last year. So a few days ago, there was the opening of the exhibition of the 25 first years of the Helsinki School of Photography. You are one of the, the main photographers of this country. You would recognize that, but I could say that you are the really a very, very important artist in, in, in Finland and not only in Finland, but in Europe. So what it means for you, the, the Helsinki School of Photography, what happened after the foundation of this Im important school to promote photography in this Nordic country? The Helsinki School was sort of, it, it happened in the University of Art and Design, where I studied, which is now called the Aalto University, as you said. It was in the late 90s when photography was becoming a more and more important part of the contemporary art scene internationally. And we had one professor 
who had the intelligence of like taking the students out from the school and throwing them into the real world. And the real world in this context was rather modestly the Stockholm Art Fair. So that was my first experience of what it is to show your work to an international art public. And uh, it was not so common in art schools, I think, in those times that actually the artists are sort of put into this framework of, of the commercial art world. I mean, a fair art fair is commercial, which I think is a really great educational project. And without this, probably not so many people would have heard of Finnish photographers. So I, I do see it as uh, a, a, the platform that made Finnish photography internationally known. Elina, thank you very much for this opportunity. I would like to thank you several times because we have the opportunity to see your work in room number four of Proa in the second floor, the Black Bay sequence. And now we have the opportunity to meet you directly and to know so much about your interesting work. Thank you very much again. Hope to see you very, very soon. And thank you to all the people that listen to us today. Muchísimas gracias y hasta muy pronto.